thanks for coming out. I know it's a very, very busy time of the term, and, and you all have papers to write and projects to finish, but thanks for coming out to, to see the finalists for the third annual Wheelwright Fellowship competition. Um, and we're excited. This is actually, for those of you who don't know, the first time that we've presented the finalists. In the, in the past, we have, we've had finalists that come down, uh, and, and then we've, we've Skyped interviews and things for the finalists. But this time, um, Ben and Mosin decided, and Kathy decided that um, to actually have the finalists present their work to the school was a way, well, it was a way of kind of soaking them even further for their, for their energies and efforts <laughs> after a very robust application, as we know. But, but it was a way to bring, but because part of what the Wheelwright does is, is emphasize design as research. It brings to the school uh, examples of what technically should be obviously some of the best examples of uh, architecture design as research. And so we decided to bring the finalists out to, um, to Cambridge uh, to present their work, which they'll do here. Um, I just want to mention briefly, the, for those of you who don't know, the Wheelwright Prize is a very, very old prize. It's one of the oldest that, that the GSD has. And it has always been the most Im important in the sense of prestige, but also um, income. It's a traveling prize, and, and we, though it doesn't say this, we all suspect and feel fairly confident that it was modeled on the, the great tour, you know, the idea of a grand tour. It was only for Americans, only for, for, for the Department of Architecture, uh, and you can't travel in the United States. You, it was assumed you would go to Europe, that sort of thing. So it was a very old, and, and a prize in a way to legitimate the idea of the architect as uh, sort of intellectual, uh, cultured, um, you know, worldly uh, person, uh, rather than just a kind of technical training. And in that spirit, um, it used to be only for alums, but three years ago, Mosin decided to open it up uh, uh, to globally, uh, it's it's completely open. The um, the uh, endowment had risen to the point that the income from the endowment is over a hundred thousand dollars a year, which which makes it the equivalent of the Pritzker Prize. Ben was saying, though, if you read the terms of the Pritzker Prize, it says the winner gets a hundred thousand dollars and a gold medallion, bronze. you know, <laughs> bronze, bronze, bronze. So we have to work on that. We have to work on that. Yeah. So sorry, sorry, Gia, you didn't get the medallion. We, we'll work on the, we'll work on the medallion. Um, and, but, but yet it's very, very different because this is for someone who maximum is 15 years out of, out of school. So it's really someone who's entering a, a point in their career where, where, where $100,000 could really make a difference in the kind of practice that, that they can have. And this is the hope here, that these are people who have, who have practices, who usually are in their own um, you know, studio or they founded their own practices, and we hope that this prize will really make a difference. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna not go on because I'm gonna introduce them quickly. Um, but just before, I did want to say, sorry, I've lost, Kathy, I've lost my, here, here we go. Um, we, we had 200 submissions this year, ish, right? Because what happens, Kathy and Ben screened them to, that they're absolutely complete before we actually get them. So there probably were twice that that weren't complete in one way or another or, or, or weren't adequate in one way or another. But the, but the committee sees 200 um, submissions. Um, more important, they were from 51 nations, and this, this though, though for the first for all three years they've been they've been global. But this time they were really were countries, um, places re uh, represented that that were there for the first time. Um, um, our finalists themselves are varied, let's say ethnically, nationally. Um, um, and <laughs> And otherwise, I'm sure, but 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 um, but what, to, to to keep it with that, uh, an American based in Singapore, Eric, um, an Israeli Dutch uh, based in Amsterdam, a Vietnamese American from Richmond, Virginia, who thinks she's Southern, but but she actually lives in London, so it doesn't count anymore. <laughs> but um, uh, Eric Larue is currently the the uh, American in Singapore is currently an assistant professor at the National University of Singapore, where he teaches building envelopes um, in equatorial climates. I, I, I do want to say, I, I know I'm not supposed to go on, but I do want to say that each of these, the the reason these finalists are here, is that they have practices 
out of which grows organically a research project. We saw many, many um, examples of people who, who have a, you know, a, a, a reasonably good practice, but then what was regarded as research was something completely different than design, something more technical, more social, more in whatever ways outside of the design practice itself. And all three of these you see is an organic relationship with their research projects and their design practices. And it's that design as research, which I think we were really um, after. Uh, Malkit Shoshan, um, the Israeli Dutch in Amsterdam, um, is a founder of the Amsterdam-based architectural think tank, FAS. It stands for Foundation for Achieving Seamless Territory. And her work um, explores the relationship between architecture, politics, human rights, um, and, and it's some of the, you, it, you, many of you will know her uh, Atlas of Conflict, uh, Israeli-Palestine. It was the uh, 010 publication um, in actually 2010. Um, and, and, and Quinn Vantu um, is, uh, uh, again, as I said, a, a, a Vietnamese American, uh, an architect and an artist with a studio-based practice devoted to spatial experimentation and in particular issues of threshold welcoming, this is how I know she was Southern, this hospitality thing, dimension of her work, um, and that's really drawn, uh, drawn in some ways I think from her, her childhood. And, 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 and you'll see her work, it's, it's very, so the installation projects um, range from sort of architecture and art practices, but always uh, issues of sort of deeper, more fundamental issues of, of spatial practice. So what we're going to do is ask each of the speakers to come up in, in alphabetical order uh, and make a short presentation. I'm just going to let them follow one after the other and save the questions and discussions till the end where we'll have some time. And we really would like for you guys to inter interact with them, bring out, uh, you know, through your questions, bring out uh, the dimensions of their of their work and, and compare and contrast. And this is, I think, just think is a very, um, it's, it's a very special time to be able to see these finalists. I'll mention just one more thing um, before I turn it over to Eric. Uh, Gia Wolf, our first uh, inaugural um, Wheelwright winner, will be here. Well, she's here right now, but she'll uh, be speaking tonight at 6, 6.30, as always, at 6.30, uh, showing some of the things that she's been doing this year with, uh, with her Wheelwright uh, prize. Uh, Eric, would you begin? Eric LaRue. Thank you, Michael, and uh, thank you to Harvard University for having me here. Um, I'm delighted to be among such a talented group of finalists. Um, and I hope I've brought a little warm equatorial air uh, to the auditorium. Uh, last I checked the weather in Singapore, where I'm based, was uh, 92 degrees with 83% humidity. Um, this afternoon, I will show a small sampling of my design work, um, followed by an abbreviated summary of my wheelwright application, illustrating how I hope practice, design, and research are one larger continuum for me. Uh, I begin hot and wet the equatorial city and the architectures of atmosphere with a quote from Maxwell Fry and Jane Drew from 1956. The rapid increase in population over the area of the tropics presents itself to the world as a problem of utmost gravity. Let me just get used to this here. Uh, what was a pressing concern over 60 years ago has become an issue of critical, if not dire, importance today. As a large portion of the world's growing population occurs in the tropical belt, the resulting urbanization, dramatic territorial transformation, and rising temperatures are altering the equator in substantial and unforeseen ways. Operating in this region, as I do, demands an entirely different set of architectural strategies from the temperate, leaky rather than sealed, dark rather than light, deep rather than thick, perforated rather than closed. Uh, I'm gonna only show two projects today uh, that I've completed in Southeast Asia, where each one takes on questions of atmosphere, increasing urban density, and perception under the rubric of deep veils, which is for me a loose and convenient metaphor that frames the ambition of my work. In simple terms, a deep veil is a hazy screen that uses depth and solid materials to wrap the architecture, to reconfigure the relationship with the hot and wet environment, 
into one that engages atmosphere itself as the prime medium of architecture. I'm especially interested in visual, thermal, and atmospheric qualities that destabilize our expectations of architecture through spatial and material means. For example, in this self-portrait by Gertrude Arndt from 1930, the veil interrupts and gets between our expectations of her face and the understanding of her features. We see a double image, flattened and distorted from one vantage point, deep and full of contour from another. The first project that I will show is for a house located in the southern shore of Singapore in a plant housing development with amazingly close building proximities. In this project called Stereoscopic House, I ask two questions. How can a hot and wet envelope, a deep veil, be used to test the relationship between building and climate? Can the veil perform thermally as well as optically? The house was commissioned by three older single Singaporean Chinese sisters, all in their, 19, in their 60s and 70s. Located on the flat reclaimed landscape of Singapore, the house is sandwiched between an ocean view, a golf course view, and two neighboring units that are just two meters away to the left and to the right. The architecture manipulates the relationship between atmosphere, water, landscape, and view through four levels of optical and thermal calibration. A tight sight drives a stacked approach to living and looking with architecture as a lens to both. A basement plinth contains various support functions of the house. The main living level, situated on top of the plinth, is surrounded by translucent channel glass. The upper volume is protected by two verandas. Here, the western veranda is composed of operable screens. While the eastern elevation is more transparent with the veranda set deep within the building volume. When so desired, the entire wall can be opened, allowing the inside to transform to an exterior space. There is a dramatic framing of a view to neighboring islands from the third story bedroom. From there, looking out to the sea is a perfectly framed experience. The bedroom also overlooks an elongated second story terrace, which is here. The view forward is extended while the views left and right are completely internalized. A large four-story airwell, a spatial void, operates as an atmospheric positive, bringing light and ventilation to a climactic center for the house. You can see the terrace here, then it connects down into this uh, airwell. Looking up from the basement plinth, a kaleidoscopic play of reflection and screen, screen twists as a stack effect cooling device is at the heart of the architecture. About the longitudinal axis, the house inverts itself on it to its interior, creating an acoustic, thermal, and visual funnel, drawing air from the cooler sea in while providing privacy from the surrounding neighbors in close proximity. The verandas are attenuated, pulled deep into the house's interior, linking perimeter to center as a contiguous thermal space. A veil of 30 by 80 millimeter regionally sourced ironwood creates an air gap between the inner and exterior skin. It minimizes the thermal transmittance to the building while allowing for rainwater runoff. The veil ventilates, leaks, and breathes through its surface. The herringbone pattern is coupled with the timber's ability to age to a silver tone, amplifying the veil's ability to reflect solar radiation. A long overhang drains the roof, creating a double veil of sorts, one of timber, the other of raindrops during the ubiquitous equatorial storm. While on the western elevation, which receives the greatest amount of insulation, aluminum screens allow the house to oscillate between screened and transparent, closed and open, sealed and ventilated as an extension of the veil metaphor, or as Rainer Bannon would describe, the selective mode of climate control. Angular skylights double as literal chimneys, in this case, thermal and tropical ones, evacuating the buildup of hot air rather than smoke or soot. These protrusions amplify the dramatics of light even on the largely overcast days on the equator, creating an atmosphere of light and temperature modulation. Skylights are also found in the plinth with a series of CNC cut trumpet shaped apertures, bringing reflected light to the lower level. Low E glazing, solar hot water heating, and rain harvesting systems are rendered discreet and invisible, while they are combined with the typologies of the tropical veranda and the Singapore shophouse courtyard in a composition of form and environmental function. 
The result is an architecture of passivity that doesn't fall into the typical gadget-like traps of environmental architecture and reasserts atmosphere itself as the primary driver of the design. The second project I will show is a simple factory building which confronts most directly the problematics of the densifying equatorial city. Can a deep veil reconcile conflicting atmospheric demands? Can it interfere with the perception of normative architectural form and the challenges of increased urban densities? A simple factory building addresses these questions while confronting the mitigation of tropical solar radiation and the openness views and transparencies sought by the clients for an often neglected building typology. The 11,000 square foot building is located in a rapidly growing industrial area of Singapore. Found in a mid-block party wall arrangement, the design synthesizes a series of simple yet important atmospheric strategies that in its totality is both open and closed, durable and adaptable, passive and active. The hope is that the design is a resistance to the symbols of the temperate and the transparent. The architecture utilizes a simple 1.4 meter deep veil fabricated in lightweight EIFS, or affectionately known here in the US as drive it, that wraps the, that wraps the building in section and a bronze full height window wall to reconcile this conflict between thermal opacity and visual and breeze transparency. The overall massing is of 24 meters, six meter floor to floor heights ensure that warm air rises while keeping the workshop floors cool. An open cross ventilated ground floor and covered entry operates as a thermal straw, bringing ventilation smells and sounds from the city beyond through to the inner courtyard, linking exterior to interior, street to foyer, sun to shade. A western facing core along the party wall deflects solar thermal loading, especially in the western afternoon sun. The design samples much from the ubiquitous straight settlement shop houses found throughout Singapore and Malaysia, high ceilings, a courtyard, trellis components of the facade, and of course due to its plot, party wall constru construction are all simple yet important influences for this much larger project. The profile of the veil tapers from 50 millimeters to 100 millimeters on its inner surface and is angled up to 10 degrees. The complexity of the resulting geometry is fabricated in CNC milling, while its profile increases the performance of the veil by producing significant shading and the shedding of rain from the building proper. Plans are purposefully kept extremely simple. While the architectural effort is put into the section and elevation, reasserting the vertical plane as the site for architectural innovation in the densifying equatorial city. This approach to anamorphic pattern is purposely designed to restrict views from the street obliquely. It obscures sight lines at the lower level while allowing visibility out to the surrounding landscape on the upper floor. Simple off form concrete construction and minimum petroleum membranes makes the building almost fully recyclable in the near future, an important consideration for the context of Singapore's often short building lifespan. The roof terrace is screened, minimizing heat gain to the main architectural mass. While looking up through the central courtyard, spatially a void while atmospherically a positive, we find three fresh air terraces penetrating within while being flanked by operable awning windows that allow light and fresh air to ventilate into the building interior mass. Gray water collection from a series of rooftop collection areas flush the toilets and irrigate the property. The overall result recalls the brisolet of Le Corbusier in the Villa Chaudan or a sunshade though maybe temperately misplaced carpenter center just down the street. Closer to Singapore the facade alludes to the experiments of tropical building recalling James Ferrier and partners wing on life building in Singapore from 1975 which is one of my favorites, yet made relevant to today through digital simulation and lightweight fabrication. This is a rough building. Concrete is crude, algae grows on it, dirt accumulates on the off-white facade. But for me, it looks good, it feels good, and most importantly, it belongs on the equator. I've been in Singapore now for over a decade, that small yet dense city-state on the equator, an Asian city washed from its 
gritty equatorial stereotypes and a perfect place for me to practice as both an observer and a participant. With my arrival, I was struck by a particular equatorial conundrum, being that buildings of Singapore and by and large appeared the same from my temperate origins. She's in prophylactic glass skins, transparent, and symbols for a business-friendly and open state. Yet the architecture is located in a climate of ubiquitous heat, humidity, and rain, a climate that drives people indoors rather than out, undercover rather than exposed, and toward the artificially conditioned rather than to a monsoon breeze. Singapore's architectural scene in much of the developing tropics today is entirely dependent not only on air conditioning, but more precisely on an entire mindset of the eradication of the tropical. This history of climactic erasure in Singapore can be traced to the very particular developmental strategies of the city. We're on the cusp of Singapore's independence from British colonial rule in 1959. The city realized that one of the most endemic issues was that if the tropical was going to perform and to develop, then Singapore itself had to be made to appear temperate. The logic of such ambition is that if the city looked like an urbanized Europe or America on the exterior, and felt at least the same on the interior, so too would Singapore reap similar economic benefits. In an almost Kulhausian retroactive manifesto, Lee Kuan Yew, the former prime minister, stated, air conditioning was a most important invention for us, perhaps one of the signal inventions of history. It changed the nature of civilization by making development possible in the tropics. The first thing I did upon becoming prime minister was to install air conditioners. The aspirational goals for the city were then manifest through temperate crystalline modernism in the embrace of industrialization and machine precision as a symbol that Singapore too had made it to the developed and more importantly temperate world. Today, much of the developing equatorial region suffers from similar aspirations and in so doing decapitates itself from its own atmospheric context. Erasing the knowledge that architecture not only can modulate climate as powerfully as technology, but can also embolden the experience of space and the city itself. I attempted to reconcile this particular atmospheric conundrum by resisting this climactic amnesia, returning to a wonderfully inventive history of tropical calibrated architecture in mid-century modernism. I returned to the canonical text, Tropical Architecture in the Humid Zone by Maxwell Fry and Jane Drew, and the biblical-like Manual of Tropical Housing and Building by Otto Coensberger. Climate control in these texts is primarily done through atomization. Maximizing the distance between buildings ensured that they were properly cooled, that breeze blew unobstructed, and sound was mitigated through space itself. In short, these are low-rise, low-density approaches to architecture and urbanism. Today, the challenges are very different in the hot and wet environment of urban Southeast Asia. The buffering open space traditionally between buildings has been consumed by congested urban environments. Verandas have all been but eliminated by floor plate efficiency demands. And e increased building heights have displaced the role of the overhang and the roof to that of the elevation. In this milieu of dense urbanization, the primacy of the elevation takes hold, where the vertical plane, rather than the horizontal, becomes the crucial architectural element. This is Singapore, and I should say my office is right somewhere right there. The importance of the elevation can be found in a fantastic collection of mid-century buildings rapidly being erased. They were produced at the advent of large-scale air conditioning where passivity and mechanical demands had equal sway, where atmospheric calibration was manifest through materials, not through mechanical conditioning alone. The work represents, for me, the finest of modern architecture along the equator, a language adapted to context, prioritizing shade, opacity, and materiality over transparency and dematerialization. These are heavy buildings, opaque, and for me, they belong on the equator. My proposal, Hot and Wet in the, Equ the Equatorial City and the Architectures of Atmosphere, builds and expands upon this design research into the urban realm. As the Equatorial City's relationship to climate becomes an increasing imperative, the program will research the atmospheric mediums of hot and wet architectures cited in five dense cities along the equator. Three features guide the work. Saturated urbanisms, 
deep envelopes and thick roofs. The focus is directed at modes of atmospheric calibration at the urban scale, traditionally overlooked by representation in drawings and photography. The idea is to make five short films. Humidity, temperature, breeze, sound, smell, rain, and their impact on the city and architecture alike forms the body of research. Following the winds of the northeast monsoon, east to west, I depart from Singapore to Jakarta, Kuala Lumpur, Pondicherry, Lagos, and Sao Paulo. Rapid population growth about the equator has led to tighter building aggregations, closer building proximities, and enlarged prop coverages, which change the equatorial city and architecture in profound ways. These are the very issues I confront in my own design work and are ripe for further research. The intent is to uncover and embolden a range of atmospheric gradients through the knowledge of spatial depth and the deep zone of interface between buildings in the city found about the device of envelope. If atmosphere is the glue that permeates both the city and architecture alike, then in equatorial urbanization, it is imperative to think of the city, architecture, and atmosphere as a continuum, as a climactic and cultural medium that indeed underpins living on the equator. The travel begins in Indonesia, commencing in the enormous Asian megacity of Jakarta, located in the larger urban region of close to 30, mil 30 million people. The program will make visible the relationship between urban density, atmosphere, and the deep envelopes of the Wajodo Center in the heart of this massively growing city. A short excursion to the heavy roof of the Johor market in the low-rise, high-density city of Semarang, a city being radically transformed from overlapping roofscapes to the primacy of the elevation as the city embraces its vertical future. I travel to a region of parallel atmospheric quality to Kuala Lumpur in the Klang Valley, a hybrid of British colonial and Malaysian influences with a population close to 8 million. It's there that I will research and film the KL General Hospital Complex, an aggregation of low-rise buildings in a campus arrangement from the 1960s, as well as the Diabumi Complex, a high-rise tower with screen as envelope. Both projects are being radically encumbered by a quickly urbanizing surround. The research program picks up Antonin Raymond and George Nakashima's Golkon dormitory in the smaller scale yet growing city of Pondicherry, India. It is there where I plan to travel during two distinct time periods, the cooler wet monsoon season in November and the hotter dry season in April to capture the architecture and the surrounding city in its variety of climactic states. Tracing further westward, the African experiments of John Goodwood and Gillian Hopwood's work in the super dense city of Lagos, Nigeria, Africa's largest at 21 million people, will provide the ground for a study of atmosphere in an entirely different continent and cultural fabric. Focusing on Goodwood and Hopwood's bookshop house, their eponymous Lagos-based studio and building, and the UNIC insurance headquarters will focus the work while allowing excursions to other mid-century examples in a city grappling with great population growth, as well as the challenges of climate envelope and the demands for basic infrastructure. The research will conclude with the Latin American manifestations of atmosphere in Sao Paulo, a city of 12 million, researching both the impacts of elevation in the growing city and the big roof found in work of Artigas at the Faculty of Architecture and Urbanism at the university there. Specific attention will focus on the contrasting devices of the hot and wet deep elevation as an urban figure and the big roof as a climactic cultural and architectural condenser. I will then travel to Joa, a lower rise peripheral city. It is there at Artigas' bus depot that I will focus the filming on ventilation, acoustic dampening, and the surrounding urban form, all conditioned by the heavy concrete canopy. The choice of this largely mid-20th century work is purposeful. The architecture ideas are simple and direct while being located in cities of rapid densification with five distinct cultural and atmospheric qualities. The travel itinerary offers a vibrant lens into the hot, wet, and dense future of the equatorial region. The methodology is to make and edit five films, each about eight minutes in length, 
to use the protagonist of atmosphere to structure the narratives, especially looking at the depth of envelope to reveal architecture's relationship with its urbanizing context and its own construction of climate. Tools are shown, umbrella, cap, and sunscreen included. As an architect, having been educated in a temperate climate and now only practicing in a saturated hot and wet one, understanding the challenges of the rapidly densifying equatorial city is an imperative, a topic of most gravity. At the same time, the Wheelwright Prize will lay bare the deficiencies of the ever-present and powerful temperate prejudices that percolate from north and south alike. The research, for me, is a direct extension on the full preoccupations of my design practice and my interest with the spatial and atmospheric potentials of deep envelopes. The Wheelwright Prize will offer necessary space out, outside the pressures of practice to produce new forms of research and to develop representational techniques that will underpin novel approaches to architecture and to the design of atmosphere through space and material. For me, the Wheelwright Prize will produce a more nuanced understanding of the multitude of equatorial atmospheres in the cities proposed within. The impact to my own work, to practice in general, I hope, and to the larger discourse of the hot and wet equatorial city and the architectures of atmosphere will be most valuable for our hot, wet, and dense future. Thank you. Hi. Um, well, thank you for bringing me uh, here. I'm uh, very happy and honored to be here and present my work. And um, let's start. Let's uh, just begin. Um, imagine heavily militarized international coalition forces invading your city in the name of peace and on behalf of the UN. They occupy enormous amount of space in close proximity to your neighborhood. The UN facilities pollute and generate immense amount of waste and noise and traffic. Trucks we supply comes in and out, crossing and jamming the city day and night. The construction of these facilities used up all local resources. Civic and communal construction projects like schools, medical clinics, and homes have to be put on hold because you cannot get construction material. The compound is surrounded with walls and barbed wire, and in no time it becomes the most prominent element in the landscape of your city. This type of missions and compounds are already in place in more than 150 African cities, located mostly in the Sahel area. Cities that cannot provide their inhabitants with access to water and electricity, nor to help the inhabitants to survive the armed conflicts or the famine that is caused by long period of drought and climate change. The global forces, although there to bring peace, increase resentment and conflict. At the end of the mission, they strip away their facilities of all valuable materials and leave the rest behind as waste for the local to resolve. These missions should transform into catalysts for local development. They should fight poverty in the same way they fight militarized groups or facilitate extraction of resources. Pro providing 150 cities with basic infrastructure should be the depart departure point of the new type of missions. This is the focus of my work, to bring alternative thinking and alternative methods to the way we design our surroundings. In the past year, I have introduced urban design and architecture tools to the policymakers and the engineers at the Dutch ministries of foreign affairs and defense, trying to make them think differently about their involvement with UN missions and explore with them possibility to actually help the local community that, that lives next to their compounds. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Today I'm going to talk about 
uh, two projects that I've been working on in the past, Atlas of the Conflict Israel-Palestine uh, and Village. I'm going to talk about my current research on the architecture and landscape of war and peace and uh, my future plan to go to Mali to study the impact of the UN mission and its bases on the local community during the implementation phase of the mission. I studied architecture in Italy and in Israel. In Italy, I learned the importance of history. After moving back from Italy to Israel, in one of my first studio assignments, we have been asked to design a shopping mall in the south of Tel Aviv. As a good Italian student, I went to the archives to research the history of, my, of the site, and I discovered Palestine. I found aerial photos that were taken in the 1930s during the British mandate in Palestine. The photos depicted a completely different city and reality than the one I knew. I decided that instead of designing a shopping mall, I should learn the history of my country. I began to research the territorial transformation of the country. As an architecture student, I had to illustrate and give scale to my findings, so I positioned them on the map. It was very easy to find materials about the evolution of the Israeli landscape. Every land acquisition, every new locality that has been founded was celebrated, documented, and placed on the map. One by one, these, uh, these um, localities created a territorial continuity and eventually a country. However, it was very difficult to trace back the existence of Palestine. As we all know, maps and territorial, territorial representations are powerful tools. They provide strategic understanding of the reality on the ground. They are mostly controlled by the state and by power institutions. The Palestinian community was under occupation for centuries. Before Israel, they were under Ottoman and British rule. These colonial powers conducted land surveys. But after the creation of Israel, these surveys were shelved deep in archives. Step by step, I managed to uncover with my research this unrecognized landscape. By finding the right shelves, I spent hours in archives and by using the help of local NGOs. Eventually, the territorial analysis and the maps that I put together not only showed me the striking emergence of Israel, it also showed the shrinkage and the dis disappearance of Palestine. Architecture and spatial design are powerful tools that can alter or create a desired reality. This can have major impact on the way community lives. It, it took me 10 years to find, draw, and compile the maps and turn them into a book. Why did I create this book? I did it, first of all, for myself, because I wanted to understand the history of my country. It wasn't part of my curriculum in schools in the, during the military training or in the university. It was a completely inaccessible information, a history that was not told. Eventually, I published it because I thought it should, be part, it should be a public knowledge. The Atlas of the Conflict is divided uh, into 10 chapters and a lexicon. The Atlas illustrates, decade by decade, a century of special transitions in more than 500 maps that appears like time frame. Israel is depicted in blue and Palestine in brown. The two national entities shape one another, they exist next to and on top of each other. While working on the Atlas, I read about a type of Palestinian localities that until that moment, I didn't even know existed. These places were not documented on the official maps of the country. About 100,000 Arab citizens of the country are living in villages that are not deliberately drawn on the map localities without an address. Having no address in a modern state results in a bureaucratic nightmare. The inhabitants of the unrecognized villages cannot have access to uh, state services, 
like water, electricity, education, or medical care. This unrecognized landscape demonstrates once again the power of visual representation of mapping. It shows how an entire existence can be overlooked by a seemingly minor action, not drawing a village on the map. I wanted to include the map of the unrecognized villages in my atlas. At that time, no one had an inclusive map of these villages. It was before the time of Google Earth. Luckily, I discovered that in Haifa, where I, where, where I was born and grew up and lived at that point, there was a small NGO that helped the inhabitants of these villages, mostly by providing them a legal assistant and rep representing them in court against home demolitions. I knocked on the door of that NGO and met Muhammad Abu Hija. Muhammad was born and lived his entire life in an unrecognized village. He was also the founder of that NGO, and he helped me to draw the map, and in the process we became very good friends. His personal story was mind-blowing, and it became the departure point of another project that I documented in the book Village. Village came out a few months ago, and I consider it as a complementary work to the Atlas. Village is like diving into one pictogram, into one dot on the map, and from that place I try to extra extrapolate as many voices and as many narratives as possible in order to get a better understanding of the complex livelihood in Israel. The village is called an Khud. It was said that Muhammad's ancestor was Salah Adin best warrior, Abu al Haja. Abu Elijah helped Salah Adin to defeat the Crusaders, and in return, he gave him a lands in Palestine. One of these pieces of land was in Khud. A few hundred years later, it resulted with a prosperous community of 9,000 inhabitants living in a beautiful village on the foot of Mount Carmel, just south of Haifa. During Israel War of Independence, the village of Enchud was confiscated by the Israeli army and its inhabitants were forced to leave. Most of the villagers ended up in refugee camps in the West Bank and in Jordan. However, Muhammad's grandfather, Abu Khilmi, with his wives, daughters and son, decided to stay nearby. He hoped to be able to go back to his village at the end of the war, but he was never allowed. His village was confiscated, fenced, and guarded, and he was considered a trespasser. He had no choice but to rebuild his house elsewhere, one kilometer away and in a viewing distance of his former home. He began to build a new Enchud. After 1948 war, the confiscated village of Enchud was used by the Israeli army as a training facility for urban warfare. In early 1950s, Marcel Yanko, an avant-garde Dada artist and an architect, discovered Enchud. Yanko was one of the initiators of the Dada movement and of Cabaret Voltaire in Zurich. He originally came from Romania. He moved from Budapest to Zürich during the First World War. He dreaded history and the old world. He was eager to reinvent himself and the arts. During the Second World War, he fled a Nazi pogrom and arrived to Palestine, forced to start a new life. In Israel, he was hired by the new government planning authority together with Ari Sharon, an architect who was trained at the Bauhaus school who also ended up in Palestine. The two modernist avant-garde figures used architecture and art tools to create a new country. While Sharon was conceiving cities to be topped down, Yanko was appointed to draw the plans of the future national park. This is Yanko and this is Sharon. Uh, during an excursion, uh, sorry, one was building up the country and the other one was narrating the unbuilt. During an, an, an excursion to, to the north of the country, Yanko discovered the old Palestinian village of Enchud. It reminded him of Monteverita and his old artistic experimentations in Europe. 
He fell in love and asked the government to give him the village. He wanted to turn it into an art commune. The government agreed, and Yanko invited his artist friends to join. Together, they started an art experimentation that led to the invention of the modern Israeli identity. They changed the name of the village from Enhod, from Enhud, a place of water in Arabic, to Enhod, the place of splendor in Hebrew. Some of them wanted to change it to Chagall or Picasso, but Enhod passed. They regarded the village as a found object. And 30 years later, Yanko admitted that Enhod, that, that Enhod was his last Dada act. These two realities of Enhod and Enhud, the Israeli and the Palestinian villages, still exist next to each other. Muhammad helped me to draw the map of the unrecognized villages, and we remained friends. After delivering my graduation project at the Technion, almost the same day I left Israel and founded FAST, an Amsterdam-based architectural think tank. My first projects dealt with Enhud, where I also tried to experiment with the use of art and architecture in order to raise awareness and to, find, to create alternative uh, design solutions uh, that deal with situation, unrecognized situations like Enhud with complex reality. Um, I used here in the, I just show quickly some images of the projects that I created uh, uh, during four years of working on the, dealing with the unrecognized village of Enhud from an architecture competition, exhibitions, publications. Uh, we brought, uh, four years after working on the project, we brought, brought it back to the village, to Enhud from abroad, and uh, we exhibited some of the processes there, and we showed also, here you, uh, we turned the village into an artist village. We invited vi uh, artists from all over the world to join us and to start uh, uh, working together with the inhabitants, create alternative spaces. We made a master plan with the villagers and we used the occasion to lobby it against, with the Israeli authorities. Uh, these are... Uh, this is a map of the art installations that were meant to bring the master plan to life. It was part of the log lobbying strategy. This is a work by Ona Friedman and Multiplicity, who joined us there. One architecture, Baron Streak. Thomas Saraceno made an installation, a beautiful installation, and Dan Graham joined us there. Um, Muhammad helped me to draw the map of the unrecognized villages, and we remained friends. And uh, for me, working on the Atlas, meeting Muhammad and the community of Enhu changed the way I practice architecture. It made me realize the strong relation between architecture, politics, and ideology, and the impact of war and armed conflicts on people's livelihood. Um, war and territorial conflict are not to be found only in Israel and Palestine. The Institute of Economics and Peace issued recently a report saying that out of 162 countries around the world, only 11 countries are not involved in conflict, almost the same as it was at the end of the Second World War. In his book, War and Peace, Tolstoy described two types of spaces, the ballrooms, the living spaces of the people, and the battlefields. A faraway militarized zone where the battle was fought. This dichotomy and separation between ballrooms and battlefields is no longer there. After the collapse of the Soviet Union and increasingly after 9 11 and the war on terror, we witnessed major shift, shifts in the conduct of war and peace. If the wars of the 20th, 20th century were between nations mostly fighting over territorial sovereignty and along disputed borderlines, the wars of the 21st century moved to the city. They are internal and borderless. They are fought between large international coalition of security regimes and insurgent networks. But not only the war moved to the city, the security apparatus, the, the peacekeepers and all their infrastructure moved with it. UN peacekeeping operations started in 1948, just after the establishment of the UN. 
the peacekeepers were representatives of world nation. They are working together to reduce armed conflict and the devastation of war. In fact, the first peacekeeping mission took place right after the creation of Israel. It was meant to stabilize the border of the new country with its neighboring nations and to stabilize the situation with the Palestinian refugees. Since 1948, we can divide the evolution, sorry, we can divide the evolution of missions to three generations of peacekeeping. The first generation of mission took place from 1948 until the collapse of the Soviet Union. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, these missions were modest in size, budget, and footprint. They operated mainly along disputed national borderlines, and they were lightly militarized. The second generation of mission of missions started at the end of the Cold War and lasted until 9/11. From operating along border lines, they moved to operate internally inside countries. Their infrastructure and bases got inserted within the local civic environment. The most distinct moment of change was in the mission in Kosovo. There, the UN peacekeepers performed outside the traditional boundaries of the mission. They operated on military, political, social, and humanitarian levels simultaneously. The international community experimented with a comprehensive approach in order to reconstruct the, lo sorry, the local environment. They introduced new laws, trained judges and police officers, built courtrooms and new prisons. They introduced new education systems, trained teachers, and built new schools. They put into place new economic infrastructure to open the local market to the global economy. The UN peacekeeper executed a ruthless project of so social engineering. As the scope of these missions expanded, so did their physical uh, footprint. In 2006 and 2007, I, tra uh, I traveled to uh, Kosovo. At that time, it seems that there are, are more foreigners in the country than local inhabitants. Foreign presence and compounds were everywhere. It looked as if Kosovo hosted Olympic Games every day in the past decade. Despite the fact that these compounds were built for temporary use, they were made of long-lasting materials. At the end of the mission, most of these foreign spaces were left behind, like white elephant, after the Olympics for the locals to figure out. The third generation of peacekeeping missions emerged after 9-11 and the launch of the war on terror. These missions are even bigger, and they are much more militarized. Mega peacekeeping missions that operate deep inside the inhabited areas. They deploy huge logistic hubs in the countryside to feed the mission and its forces. The mission in Afghanistan was the most expensive mission in history. Now it is being withdrawn. Its bases are stripped of valuable equipment and the rest is left as waste. The general funding of UN missions per year increased from 4 million US dollars in 1948 to 8,700 million US dollars in 2014, more than 2,000 folds, and this growth doesn't seem to end there. The global missions are happening whether we want them or not. It would take decades and even more to restore and integrate the UN occupied spaces back to the local fabric. At the same time, we all know that conflicts are, are mostly weak and are in desperate need for resources. Design can play here an important role. It can help turning the foreign waste into local resource. The close relations between military engineering and city planning is not a new idea. In the Netherlands during the 16th century, at the engineering faculty at Leiden University, faculty members like Simon, uh, Simon Stevin and Van Schoten planned forts. They designed them for time of war and for time of peace. The peaceful scenario depicted the fort cities with churches and towers, town folks and farmers busy in daily routine. While the war scenario de depicted the great violence, soldiers and heavy armor. 
many of these forts grew into prosperous towns that exist until this day. Similarly to even older Roman military bases that laid the foundation of prospering cities for centuries to come. Can architecture design and design thinking sti stimulate a paradigm shift, making the UN forces to th think differently about the impact of their bases on the local context? In the past year, I've invited to the new institute, or what, what is known as the Netherlands Architecture Institute, as a fellow there, the Dutch partners of the UN uh, peacekeeping operations. I brought together engineers and policymakers from the Ministry of Defense, Development Aid, and Foreign Affairs to join a design experimentation. It was the first time that they actually talked with one another. I asked them if they ever thought about the waste that they leave behind at the end of the mission. Actually, this guy was leading the mission, uh, was the head of the mission in Afghanistan of the Dutch forces. And he's one of the, he was one of the uh, brainstorming session uh, group. And I tried to introduce to them the notion of legacy I asked if we can work together to change the legacy of the mission footprint. At first, I suggested to design in advance the future use of the base by assigning its element to be either traceless or transform their use such that they can be taken over by the local. As reference, we looked at our cities, where elements are constantly being recycled and transformed or pre-cycled, um, or adjusted to a new use, or pre-cycled in advance for multiple uh, purposes. The second step of the exercise was to modify the plan of the base, to change its typology, ident identifying elements that could be shared with the local population already in the beginning of the missions. Elements like hospitals, sport and recreational facility, workshops and markets that are now located in the center of the base should move to the periphery and allow the local population to use them uh, in the very beginning of the mission. The third step elaborated the possibility of using the intelligence that exists in the base, like the engineering know-how, the machinery, and the foreign capacity to improve the basic infrastructure of the entire city, especially when the oper uh, these operations are taking place in cities that have no basic infrastructure. The military in engineers admitted that they have never thought about the legacy while developing their designs. They realized that this socially aware attitude can in fact reduce conflict. They were inspired and they are still enthusiastically on board with this uh, experiment. The diplomats were more skeptical but they were curious enough to be the hosts of the next workshop at the ministry and possibly with the presence of the Minister of Foreign Affairs. And they are ready to uh, start developing a pilot for the UN. In fact, they suggested to start elaborating further the idea using a, a specific case study. They suggested to test the design for legacy approach on their current mission in Mali which brings me to my future plans. In the recent years, the UN has initiated nine large peacekeeping operations in Africa, mostly in the Sahel region bordering the Sahara. Life in the Sahara Desert and in the Sahel is dynamic and in constant flows. The harsh climate forces a completely different use of space than the one we experience here in the West. The borders of the desert are not national, they are seasonal. The nomadic lifestyle is embedded with nature and with what the desert has to offer, and it's not much. People and their herd move from one place to the other, looking for water and food. Their homes are not grounded to one place. They extend over a large territory, and it's the only way to survive the desert. In the past years, the Sahel area was subjected to many conflicts, from war over resources to national uprising and the conduct of many international missions. It resulted with an intensifying international pre presence 
including many peacekeeping missions. One of these uh, uh, mission forces is based in Camp Castor in Gao, that is, uh, that is built and controlled by the Dutch peacekeepers. Gao is an old city located along this, uh, alongside the Niger River and, in major, uh, and major continental cross routes. It is a city of flows. Throughout history, different culture came together in Gao. The Sahara dwellers and the emperors, the slaves and the slave traders. The ethnic, its ethnic and religious configuration is diverse and culturally it is very rich. Um, in, in Gao, climatological and geopolitical transition drive many people to seek refuge in cities. Gao is a second tier city in the region and it is expect expected to triple its size in the coming 20 years. Uh, currently 90,000 people live in Gao, 10,000 of them are refugees and thousands of its former Tuareg dwellers were forced out because of the conflict and currently inhabiting refugee camps in neighboring countries. The inhabitants of the city rarely have access to water and electricity. After the conflict, most of the NGO and development aid agency left town. It is only the local inhabitants, the conflict and the UN peacekeepers that remain intact. A design intervention here can have a large impact on the way on the local uh, livelihood. Imagine if we could change the legacy of war and peace in Gao. Not only by recycling the base such that no waste will be left behind, but to use the mission and the base as a catalyst for local development and prepare the city to absorb the additional 160,000 inhabitants that it will need to house in the coming 20 years. We can collaborate with the missions engineer to make sure that the wells that are dug by the peacekeepers will start supplying water to the local inhabitants as soon as possible. Making water infrastructure may have the effect of the old Roman aqueduct. But not only water, but also waste uh, treatment, electricity and medical care can be made available in a very short time. Innovative economic structures can be used to mitigate between defense, development aid, and local refurbishment. In fact, the city, and, uh, uh, the city can and should be reconstructed not by the foreigners, but by its local inhabitants. A successful pilot in Gao can be re replicated to other uh, bases in Mali, to cities like Timbuktu and Mopti. Sorry, I don't... Yeah, I'm almost there. Okay. Sorry. Uh, well, a successful pilot in Gao can be replicated to other bases in Mali, to cities like Timbuktu and Mopti, and even further to other 150 cities in the rest of the Sahel that are currently subjected to UN peacekeeping operations. In my work, pilot and research runs parallel. I seek to make visible large scale and phenomenal transitions in society, exploring and highlighting all sorts of processes from militarization to border mobility, migration, nomadic, uh, nomadism, rapid urbanization, etc. In order to engage with these topics, we need to first make them visible and accessible. That is why I propose to go to Mali the information that we have about conflict zone in general and about the Sahel and Africa is very limited and a real, price, a real right price can give me the freedom to conduct an independent research, which is very important, independent research, because I don't want to go as an ambassador with an agenda to visit cities in Mali, like Bamako, Timbuktu, and Gao, to document the influence and the impact of the UN mission on the local context in er early in its implementation phase. And uh, um, I, I think I, will, I should just end here. I had uh, another f uh, part, but uh, I think I said most of the thing I wanted to say. So thank you. <laughs> Thank you.
barely see me behind the podium, right? <laughs> Well, first of all, I'd like to say thank you to the uh, Will Wright Committee and Harvard GSD for having me here. Um, it really is an honor and pleasure to be able to share my work and proposal with you. Let's see. So I call myself an architect slash artist, um, but often these days I feel like I'm more interested in, in contemplating the slash <laughs> My proposal is on movement, the threshold, and its shaping of, the, of culture and spatial experience. Um, not only is my research about um, considering the architectural threshold and our movement between spaces, but also my very practice is between the threshold of architecture and art. Um, I'm interested in architecture that intersects art with the idea that architecture is not only something that we look at, but something that we look through. Um, in a way, it's also um, both the foreground and, our, and the background of our kind of everyday experiences and engagements um, in a way to filter and, and view the world. Um, I'm also interested in how uh, the body engages with our built environment, um, taking cues from uh, the architecture and that we encounter. Um, this is an earlier installation that I did um, made of ceiling planes that were hung at my height, which is five foot. <laughs> so anybody kind of um, encountering this installation, having to traverse this lobby space, had to kind of um, alter and uh, uh, maneuver their body uh, in order to confront this ceiling plane that was hung at five foot. Um, and I feel it was less about, I guess, a self-portrait of myself, but just kind of displaying that we all are different heights um, in this. Uh, my research investigates the threshold as an active space in architecture. Um, and I'm seeking to employ movement as a design element um, as it is a generator for spatial experience. Um, the threshold is of particular interest to me because I feel like it's the most active space in architecture. It's a space that we move through and um, go from uh, inside to outside, public to private. Um, and it ushers us in and out of spaces and offers opportunities um, for engagement with the built environment. Um, the threshold, um, is a physical manifestation of movement, signifying transition from one space to another, becoming both a place for spatial and social negotiation. I recall one of my first um, considerations of the potential of transitional space from a memory as an architecture student. I remember the images of Oscar Schlemmer's um, 1932 painting, Bauhaus Stairs, and Theodore Lux Feininger's 1927 photograph of the weavers on the Bauhaus stairway. Um, and through traveling and visiting the Bauhaus um, firsthand for study abroad while I was a student at Virginia Tech, um, I envisioned kind of this moment uh, on the grand staircase and the many creative minds that must have encountered and passed each other here. Um, chances for engagement and interaction, the notion of movement through this, these transitional spaces of great um, importance to my consideration of endeavoring uh, this research. I'd like to look at um, these transitional spaces as a more motive space that brings us across um, places and rooms and therefore promotes or at least provides an opportunity for an interaction and engagement to occur. I'm looking at an expanded notion of the threshold that includes a prolonged passage through space and the transitional zones of corridors, stairways, and passages that also provoke social interactions. And this is probably the, one of the most recent works just happened maybe four weeks ago, but it's a, a stairway with alternating, or with um, 
uh, varying tread heights, so you have to be mindful of, of how you step across these stairs. But I worked with two uh, performers uh, to choreograph a performance on kind of the site of these stairs, and the stairs in a way, because of their um, because of just their physical nature of how you have to move across it, also became uh, a choreographer uh, of, the, of the dance as well. Um, for my wheelwright proposal, I'm using a Japanese and Korean architecture as my departure point. Um, there is a rich history and tradition in the design of a more articulated um, threshold condition that incorporates cultural ideals as well as functional design and the engagement of the body um, in space, such as wabi-style tea houses with a smaller and narrow opening asking for one to humble the body um, in order to enter. Um, in Kengo Kuma's essay towards a Japanese style architecture of relationships, Kuma explains that uh, Japanese architecture is both about boundaries and relationships and also further um, talks about the notion of the Japanese term kyoke, uh, meaning boundary and threshold. Uh, although kyoke uh, refers to a boundary, it is more of a technique for articulating space and is considered um, a vague boundary between inside and outside, um, creating layered procession as a means for design. Um, such as in, in the uh, architectural elements of the veranda, which accepts both blessings and adversity equally, connecting inside and outside. This vague boundary is deliberate and um, contributes to a relationship that one has uh, with the architectural space through a movement across these zones. I'm also... Uh, I'm, also interested in the ideas of choreographed architecture as well. Um, the layered entry conditions and processional paths of the Sos Sososwan uh, Garden in Damyang, South Korea, and the Katsura Imperial Villa in Kyoto, Japan. Um, here the architecture of the threshold becomes a choreographed sequence that draws one through the space, such as the large stepping stones that one must be mindful uh, to walk across, um, to walk across these large stones, creating a particular um, rhythm of walking, uh, as it is important to engage the body with this process. I would like to experience these places with my own body uh, in space. I'm also interested in. Um, these ideas as they have, have evolved in more contemporary works, um, such as in, in Junya Ishigami's uh, Kanagawa's Institute of Technology, and is an arrangement of an irregular uh, grid of columns that allows for a meandering space to form as movement is created across this, this space. Um, different zones cross each other, and the spaces uh, are allowed to fluctuate with need. Uh, also, um, Atelier Bow Wow's uh, Tread Machia's house that situates the life of the household within the th uh, th threshold of a stair. Life revolves around and functions through this threshold as it is a constant state of proposed uh, movement. There are just a few, uh, these are just a few examples of what I'm considering uh, in looking at, at the Japanese and Korean architecture. Um, And yeah, I have to kind of admit that I'm more of a practitioner and a maker. Um, I like to get my hands dirty. But uh, in my own work, I have a studio-based practice and utilize interventions and installations um, to explore spatial concepts and questions. It's been a way for me to experiment with architecture and space um, on a one-to-one -one condition. And I find also that it's I've practiced uh, I got licensed in Virginia, um, so I did practice in offices, but um, I felt there were still things lacking for myself in the practice, so I, I left after I got licensed and, um, and just was looking for myself for a, an, an alternative way of practicing architecture. Um, so I'm gonna show you about four past works, that, uh, more recent past works that I did. Um, so the first work is Inflated, 
And this was done at the Cranbrook Academy of Art, um, designed by the Finnish architect Eliel Saarinen. And here, this is called the Perry Style. Um, it's a very kind of formal space on the campus of Cranbrook. And it's in between the Cranbrook uh, Art Museum and the Cranbrook Library. It became, it was more of a thoroughfare kind of outdoor room. No one really um, gathered in this space. But it was such a kind of iconic uh, place on the Cranbrook campus that I wanted to try to do um, some sort of intervention here. Um, so I proposed to do this. Uh, uh, there are eight 13 foot in diameter inflated spheres. Um, and they're too large to escape the columns. So essentially they're, they're trapped within it and they're free, freely movable uh, inside. Um, and anybody kind of passing through could push them around and, and engage with them. But they kind of had a life of their own in a way. Because uh, I think once you have something, or eight somethings that are 13 foot in diameter, uh, they, they, they definitely have a, a scale that's beyond yours. And um, no, it was actually really nice to see people be very playful with it. But it was also interesting that the spaces would fluctuate um, inside to be more intimate or more large or more kind of active as people, more people, less people were engaging uh, with, with these uh, spheres. And in a way, I kind of looked at them as these round, movable walls. Um, so uh, it became kind of this uh, creating these architectural spaces with inside. And another project is um, variable measure. And this project was um, done at the McCall Center for Art and Innovation in Charlotte, North Carolina, where I had an artist residency um, there at the, this, the winter of 2014. Um, and here, this project, um, is a, a series of three light projections. Um, and when first the visitor was to encounter the room, it was a fairly empty space uh, with only kind of the visible evidence of, of this light projected on the wall. So uh, that kind of naturally drew visitors into to going, especially in an art institution, going to look at works on the wall. So um, I think I had a lot of people kind of scratching their heads, like there's this empty room with light. Uh, but then as they would kind of come into the room and, and turn to go and see the other light projections, they would discover that they were within the installation itself. And so it was created with a light and haze. Um, and really, I was looking at kind of these ideas of uh, how can we define uh, architecture or space through these ephemeral um, means of, of light and air, in a sense. So the, the, the grid pattern um, created these kind of tunnels and corridors, walls and ceilings um, in the space that you could move through. And the third project um, is called Courtesy Bridge. And this was done uh, in September 2014 um, in North Shopping, Sweden, part of an exhibition that I called um, Inconvenient Architectures. Um, and here I did a series of works that were both placed within a gallery space and then also out in the city in the public sphere as well. Um, but. Um, um, but I'm going to show you just this this one kind of opening piece from the uh, from the exhibition. Um, the area that w was at was an old industrial area in Norrköping, Sweden, um, and the gallery uh, was was a former factory building. Um, and off to the side, I was I was doing the kind of construction work and um, planning of the work in in the gallery. But there was also this little bunker room that I had found, and they had told me that it opens out also to the the public, uh, public street outside. So I asked if I could use that room to do an installation. Um, so when you enter this kind of subterranean room, you're greeted with a, a very narrow uh, walkway or bridge that, that could lead you across and out. Uh, maybe it's about uh, it was 
50 centimeters, 40 centimeters, so a little bit uh, larger than the width of the shoulders. Um, and then the room was flooded uh, and the water was dyed black. So the uh, depth of the, the water was, was quite obscured, but you got this beautiful mirror finish um, surface that reflected the, the room around. So you were really con just confronted with this void um, that was below you. And of course, the visitors didn't know how deep the water was. But because the, the walkway was so, so narrow, I created these pockets off to the side that if others were to pass uh, in both directions, that you had these um, moments that you can kind of show courtesy to the other and, and let the other pass by. Um, in kind of that nod, nod to courtesy. And the last project that I'll show you is um, Humility Threshold Wind. And this was part of the uh, Vadentide um, Festival in Blavand, Denmark, which is on the very west coast. Uh, of Denmark, um, and it was a very kind of beautiful, uh, beautiful site, um, almost daunting to kind of work on such a beautiful site. Um, but they gave me, they invited uh, 15 international artists to participate in this, and it was in a way a ce celebration for the, for the area because it had just been named a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Um, but I got this this wonderful uh, site on top of a dune that overlooked the sea. Um, so I created these these two uh, these two walls um, that, in a way, were a gateway to the uh, to the sea beyond. Um, and they had these smaller openings that uh, you had to kind of have a nod to humility uh, to pass through as they were quite low and short, but as you, um, as you humble your body and pass through, you're granted you know, the beautiful view of the, the sea and the, the horizon beyond. Um, in addition, they, uh, the curators told me there that uh, they were warning all of us about the, uh, the weather that was unpredictable um, and also the, uh, the winds that were quite strong there as well. So uh, working with uh, the weather, I wanted to kind of experiment what I could do with, with this wind and created the walls to be um, an aeolian harp as well. So it's a harp that that resonates with the wind passing through just the um, just the nylon cord. So it just resonates, but the the wall uh, in between, sandwiched between, become these like sounding boards. Um, and I actually have a little sound clip. Hopefully that can work. And the mouse. The mouse is like invisible. Up oh, there. It's kind of quiet. Huh? Should I, should I start it again?
Um, yeah, and through this um, continued research in the built works and exploration of the articulated threshold traditions of Japan and Korea, I hope to gain a better um, understanding of how the threshold allows us to engage with arch the architectural experience um, as well as with each other. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Those were wonderful presentations all. Um, I'm going to very quickly uh, ask for questions from the, from the audience. I have one question. Um, and I promise you'll make your 2 o'clock class. We, we won't. Um, but I do have one question. They, and and mine, my question has to be from the, as one of the jurors. Um, I mean, they couldn't be more different projects in some way. And, and one of the things that, that we've seen every year, what's, what's happened is that the finalists come down to really good um, proposals and with really good backup um, projects, but they're very, very different. They, they, haven't been, they haven't been projects that were two variations of something that was similar. They've been very different projects and it makes it even more difficult. But the one thing about the wheelwright, that there are a lot of limitations that at first seem very peculiar, but it seems to us that it's quite clear that the wheelwright expects that <clears throat> you have to travel <clears throat> and that through the travel itself and the experience that you in, encounter in those travels, and if you think if it's based, if we're right that it was really based on the idea of the Grand Tour, you know, you go to Pestum and you sketch and you do watercolors, and, and that itself is supposed to change your life and change your career. Um, you know, it's not the money that you need to buy tools necessarily. It's not the money you, it's not the money you need to, you know, fund an installation or another kind of. It's it's the experience itself that's supposed to change your life in this, in your career. And if if this isn't unfair of me to ask you so abruptly and quickly, what will be different in your careers, in your practices, in, in your lives, what will be different um, because of the wheelwright? What, what will it enable, and you can't say the ticket to Korea, right? <laughs> because of course that's what it's going to pay for, but what will, it, what will it enable about your practice, about your career, about your life that would not, be, that would not happen otherwise? Um, can I start with you, Eric? Um, well, I, I think, it, I mean, speaking from my own proposal, in, in a way, and dare I say this, is kind of like the grand tour in reverse <laughs> along the equator. And if there is, I mean, the proposal has a certain kind of focus, which is based around particular pieces of architecture. But at the same time, I think, or I hope that I've embedded within it a kind of openness to explore these kind of uh, rapidly densifying cities that are populated uh, along the equator, but clearly they have very different cultural backgrounds, different even variations of equatorial climate in each one. And for me, the hope is to kind of go in with a kind of sharp framework, but to keep me focused, but to allow then a kind of larger peripheral vision to happen. And I, and I hope that that would really change the way that I think about atmosphere, the production of architecture on the equator. So it's to be narrow, but also very wide at the same time. And um, that's, I mean, I, I think my work will be, you know, really fundamentally changed for that. I mean, Mokit, you, you've done Atlas of Conflict. I mean, it's an amazing, our students use this all the time as a kind of paradigm for a mapping of, of conflict, but also other, as a, as a, as a tool, it's a, it's used, our students use it for other kinds of, of mappings, not, not just conflicts, but <clears throat> um, I mean, you've done that. What, um, what will be different? Well, 
this type of trip that I'm proposing to do. Uh, it's a very rare occasion at this moment in time. Uh, I'm going to explore a space uh, that um, it's very dangerous to go there. It's almost impossible to document what is happening at this moment in this area. Most of the documentation of, about this space are uh, made, created by interest groups. This means NGOs that are funded to explore one specific thing, or Western government that's sponsoring certain type of exploration of the place. It's still a land that is unknown in many, many ways. Uh, so the Atlas of the Conflict is Israel-Palestine. It's done, it's one, it's, it's one country, it's one place. It goes to depth into one place. I think here there is a, a, an opportunity to explore something that potentially can have the impact to change not just the research and the, the research, to show research methodology, but it can have the impact to change the livelihood of many, many people. Because I'm backed with, uh, I, I think I, I said, I. At a certain moment, I don't know if I can do it unless I have the support of the Dutch ministries, such that I can actually go to these places because these trips are highly uh, uh, expensive and very dangerous. So I need to go with the embassy and to know the, the partners on the ground and to do this exploration. And now I have this support, so I think it's quite rare and it's quite unique and it can create a documentation that is not existing at this moment. I mean, one of the things, I, uh, gee, I don't know if you're going to agree with this, but <clears throat> one of the things I thought about Quinn's projects, what you have in common in the, with, with Gia <clears throat> in the work that you did up to the Wheelwright application, a lot of it, it felt like were projects that you had just created that you were going to do. No one asked you to do them, but you were just going to do them, and Gia had some of those as well. And it, it's really, I don't know if I find it kind of refreshing, but, but having said that, what what would the wheelwright make make possible? How will it change those, those yeah. projects? Yeah, no, I mean you're right. They they were kind of more self initiated projects. I mean I'm also working through kind of the institutions of arts to do uh, artist residencies, and those have allowed me to kind of further um, doing some of the work. Um, but with that, uh, I've been fortunate to travel to, to some of these places and, and do the projects. But they've been kind of uh, this aim to do a project, and then I leave. So there's, there's not that much time of, of being able to be there and reflect upon the places that I've visited or what I'm doing because there is this other agenda of, of having to make uh, make something for an exhibition. Um, but uh, really, I think... I mean, it'd be like next level. <laughs> so I think that uh, the Wheelwright would really be um, a fortunate opportunity for me to go and spend some time in, in uh, a place that I've been influenced by through books and photographs and anecdotes, um, but have never spent any, any time really there, mostly in the Western world is, is where I've grown up and then also now uh, living within Europe. So I, I definitely think that it would be um, something that I could expand upon and, and, and uh, experience with, since it's these works that I feel like are so related to the body um, in the context mm -hmm. of the place and really seeing uh, what that is, what that is for me. You guys have questions or were um, this further? One, one of the things I was, I was trying to think of, <clears throat> I'm giving you time, you realize this is, this is what a moderator does when, when he doesn't get a question. One of the things I did, I was trying to think of the commonalities, <clears throat> and I, I, this, this may be stretching it too far, and, and, and Quinn's made me think of this. Quinn is working with something very, very basic about architecture, which is this kind of kinesthetic sense that you walk along a, a you know, a plank surrounded by water and you have to let someone else by, and that, that sense of body and space, but also a kind of ethic in a way that, 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 that kinesthesia also has a kind of ethics. And, and it's very basic. But I realize also that Eric's, even though, I mean, your practice is the most, I mean, you have projects that 
other architects your age would would kill for. They dream they dream about building, actually building these these projects. But in another sense, it, they're also very basic, just because they deal with weather. They, they deal fundamentally with with weather, and. And all of a sudden, when you add to these basic things of gravity, movement, wind, and, and water, and you, then you add to that uh, conflict. And conflict enters in, or, or, or more generally, just living together different people, radically different ideas about ethics, living together. What they have in common is something they each treat something very, very basic, even though the basic, you know, war is a war as fundamental as gravity to architects in the sense because it's, it's a spatial thing. You know, and gravity affects construction, but war also affects space. And so there's something there that I like. I think we did, I think we picked the right ones, and somehow they're, they're very fundamental in a way. Okay, guys. <laughs> you, you get to, you get to, you get to. <laughs> You get to give them advice at the end. Okay, you can, yeah, go ahead. I have to help <laughs> formulate this question. Um, and it might be really unfair, too. But um, so after having been on the ground um, and confronted, you know, time and again with situations where, um, where, my, like, where my goals had completely shifted because, because uh, whatever being, being in it, uh, um, Changes, you know, changes changes your objectives. I guess one thing I was really impressed of all three of your projects is how much of a project they are already. Um, so, I guess the question somewhere lies is: um, are, are there any unknowns? I mean, I know the project itself is an unknown, like a big, huge unknown, but in the kind of construction of what the project is, is there anything in there that's an unknown that might kind of, that you can begin to foresee might shift what the project could become or, or where it might go that could be something else? But I guess it's a little bit of an unfair question because you might not know this until you're out there, but. <laughs> yeah, Malki. I have something to say about it. Uh, I initiated this uh, conversation with the Dutch ministries trying to explore the footprint of UN missions. Uh, I don't know still, I, it's very difficult for me to uh, formulate my position in this research. Um, at this moment, I'm not critical toward it. I just observe, mm. take in all the information that I can have and try to uh, get an overview. But I don't, I, I think that if I go to Mali, for instance, then it will be much easier for me to formulate a position where I stand as a person, as a creative person, as a human being, if I want to, uh, to approach it as someone who really wants to work with the foreign forces or someone who wants just to describe the impact of what they do. So I think a trip will allow me to formulate where I want to stand in this research and uh, to understand better the com its complexities. And Gia, did, I know you're gonna talk about this tonight and I'm not asking you to give your presentation now, but, but, but w w answer that for yourself. Were, were, did, I mean, thing unexpected, did the project radically change as it, un as it unfolded or? It actually continues to change. Mm -hmm. um, even from last year, the thoughts and ideas that I had when I was putting the presentation for tonight, I was like throwing all those away because I, there's all these new ones that have kind of emerged out of it. But um, I think part of, for me, a lot of the issues that have that have altered my thinking of the project has been um, how I've been able to insert myself into the culture and the mm. kind of thinking like the cultural thinking that happens, mm -hmm. um, the questions that I ask, like I don't get straightforward answers. I get mm -hmm. these like really like long, layered answers that take a lot of kind of unpacking before I can get an answer. And mm -hmm. and so part of it, part of it has been the the research. Um, I guess part of it has been to try to figure out how to get the information I'm looking mm -hmm. for, and the other part of it is what comes to me. And the way that it comes to me, 
because of the, the, the different cultures shifts my own thinking about it. Hmm. I, wonder, I wonder if Eric would discover an ethnographic dimension that you're probably not thinking of now, but, but it might, you know, that there's something there that's actually interacting with the people there as opposed to just studying the buildings. Actually... And I think that's, I think that's only something that travel will afford. And so, even though I'm looking at it from a very kind of architectural point of view, I mean, the point of travel, at least the way I see it, is mm -hmm. to kind of open up how that architecture then is utilized, how it's inhabited, how it's you know rendered with certain values or even discarded with value. Maybe what I'm looking at, and I have, I just deploy certain value systems maybe are completely irrelevant to the people that are there. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm mm -hmm. hoping that maybe mm -hmm. that friction is a really good thing and maybe uh, I will be coming back or imagine coming back in, a couple, in two years and having a completely different vantage, a point of view in terms of climate and architecture than one that I kind of set out. Um, so. Oh yeah, Rosetta. Uh, um, I can try to further that. Uh, conversation, of course, we're very busy here talking about design research very often uh, in, at the GSD in different departments. Um, fundamentally different is, of course, design research is trying to imagine something does, doesn't yet exist, and scientific research tends to reflect upon the existing environment. Scientific research has great precedent, right? Uh, but design research has less. Um, perhaps a, a kind of invitation to talk about methodology, um, how, how one goes about design research uh, and articulates a method outside of just, I'm going to go and see what happens. Mm. <clears throat> mm -hmm. I think uh, um, I try to do similar things with the I think I, can, I know more or less how I do my own research. It's not based on previous methodology, but uh, uh, at first you try to get open as much as possible and to absorb as much information and input from other things. So if it's uh, from interviewing certain people, like going to the, to the context and actually listen to who lives there and who uh, use a certain environment, because I think they know the best uh, to describe where they are living. And from that, and uh, another uh, thing that I try to do is to make this information accessible through maps, through uh, visualization, diagram, etc. So you translate the, the information that you get um, into language that is easier, uh, can be accessed easily by different audience, students, academic, policy makers, etc. Um, again, I don't think it's, be of course it's built on previous methods, but it's constantly you, you define your own methodologies as you go. And uh, another thing that I always try to do when I work on my projects is, is to uh, see if it's possible to create pilots to cr to actually turn this this the research because I think with architecture and design at the end of the day you have the scientific research but we are also makers of an environment so we want to participate in either improving it or to create or so I, I try to see how this research and the the results that I got can be implemented back into the physical environment, either through intervention on policy, uh, in policy, uh, making space for it to be implemented or to actually make it. And it can be also uh, experiment uh, experimented, like the project that I've done in Anhud, which was a comp uh, both top-down and bottom-up approach, trying to work with the community and with the policy master plan. So it's not a pure research. Uh, you learn as you uh, through the investigation and find ways. I think for myself, I have a very much practice-based research. So, um, 
And I'm actually uh, currently a PhD candidate at the Bartlett School of Architecture doing a practice-led PhD, and we're having this conversation all the time between uh, design and theoretical, if you want to say, research, because we also have history and theory track as well. Um, so it's, it's always something that I've been kind of trying to negotiate. How, what does this mean with research and, and practice at the same time? But I look at, um, I look at practice also being research. So um, for myself, I feel like uh, embarking on this, I still would continue making kind of these um, installations because for being an architect, uh, I think I was always slightly frustrated with working through means of representation of um, drawings and models that, that to be able to do something one-to-one uh, -one full scale was, was yeah, something spatial that we're gonna experience and then test it out in kind of the real environment and, and see how people actually engage with it. Um, so yeah, so I still look at, I look at these kind of installations as, as these small portions of architecture that I can experiment with. You know, these last few comments, and we'll, we'll close with this, make me think, and Rosette and Scott, I don't know if you agree with this, that one of the things, one of the difficult things we have in this school the, 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 is at the point of thesis. Everyone gets all balled up and, and wringing their hands ab about thesis projects. And, and especially, as Rosetta was saying, as we start to emphasize design research as part of what the thesis should do. But I'm realizing what, what the wheelwright application process is are like really good thesis projects. And if we could, I wish this, more students had come to see how do you take, how do you take your work, how do you look back at the work you've done, which sometimes is highly contingent. I mean, I mean, some of you, you're, you're more motivated and self-defining your practices more than most people do. But even, but even so, you have to look back at what are often contingencies in the practice and systematize it and theorize it and make a, a kind of coherent frame. And then out of that frame, you devise an extension um, and a project for further research. It's a really good way of thinking about, about thesis. So. Um, for that, we appreciate it, and we uh, look forward to Gia tonight, and we, we wish you guys best of luck, and thanks very much for coming and presenting. It was really fun. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.